moment there before the prayer, I thought somebody had some phone that really needed turned off. But those things do happen, and it didn't seem to handicap anybody. Always with technological things, they go wrong. Sometime or another. <laughs> that last song introduces really my lesson for this afternoon. Because I want to speak to those who love the Lord and keep His commandments from day to day. For those who have great hope of eternal life before them. For those who are faithful in the church, workers in the kingdom of the Lord. Those who labor in His vineyard. Those who prepare for eternity who don't build their lives around the affairs of this present world for their but fleeting, but who rejoice in the hope of eternal life with our Father in Christ in heaven. The Bible clearly teaches us that we are saved by hope. A number of things in the Bible is recorded that saves us. We're saved by our own will to submit to God's will. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We're saved by faith. We're saved by baptism. We're saved by the love of God. We're saved by the Bible and so on and so forth. We're not saved by any one of them all alone. And certainly to the child of God, the one who loves the truth and lives his days on this earth serving God, then the hope of heaven is something that lifts us up to look beyond the evils of this present world and the hardships of it to see the reward that lies ahead. Romans 8, 24 just simply says, we are saved by hope. I have often used these several examples, but one I'll use again now, to show what Bible hope is. Because in modern English, many times we use hope to mean, I wish it was so. I hope it was so. And that's perfectly acceptable in modern English. But it's not used like that in the Bible. When we talk about we're saved by hope, or we talk about our hope of heaven, our blessed hope as children of God who faithfully serve Him, then we're talking about what we know we have a right to expect from our God because we've loved Him and faithfully served Him. He's promised us heaven and He doesn't go back on His promises. But it's more than knowing what lies ahead. And this is the part of biblical hope for the Christian that sometimes we, we miss. We can understand how we expect heaven Heaven is for the faithful, and if we're faithful, heaven will be our home. Our Lord said it, and that settled it. But we don't see sometimes the earnest desire built within that expectation. And it takes all three of those to make biblical hope. When you know more of your Bible, and especially when you spend time studying the passages that tell us of, the, of heaven, and when we sing songs like we just participated in, and there are many of them in the, in the psalm book. And we see many of them all the time. Then it builds us up because we know this is not always the way it's going to be. I feel sorry for the person that thinks it's just great and this is all it's ever going to be like it is right now. That doesn't give me any pick-me-up at all. And those who are wedded to this present world seemingly can't grasp that. They just don't get that the child of God is living for the future. Hope allows you to live for the future. As I say, it causes you to look beyond and over all the trials and tribulations that come upon a person because that person serves God faithfully. And he sees what lies ahead. He sees the reward. And, and we, of course, cannot begin to fathom it. To fully grasp it, to realize it, that's just not possible living in the flesh in this material world. But we're saved by that hope that has the earnest desire to receive it. The illustration I like is the little birds in the spring that are down in the nest and when their mother lands on the side of the nest, their little heads just pop up and their mouths are wide open and they're just quivering to receive what she's brought them. And that does well to illustrate 
the expectation built in the Christian's hope of that which he has a right to expect. He's promised to expect it. It's that earnest that says, I want to get there. I want to embrace it. I want to be a part of it. That's my long home. I'll never leave there. There's no departure from it. Perhaps the most eloquent dimension of Christianity is the substantial quality that undergirds our very being made in the very image of God and blesses us every day even when the burdens of life tend to overwhelm us. L.H. Jameson wrote these encouraging and words familiar to you. Speaking of heaven, he said, No night is there, no sorrow, no death and no decay, no yesterday, no morrow, but one eternal day. O Zion, lovely Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, lovely Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Faithful servants of God Almighty, build up the looking beyond this veil of tears and beyond what the Bible calls is the pale rider of death. And we look to the land of fadeless day. Or as we say in songs sometimes, the land that is fairer than day. Hope, this kind of hope, this scriptural hope, gives us purpose for our living now. An anticipation when death will come upon us in one way or one time or another. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, without hope, we would of all men be most pitiable, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. However, when loved ones die in the Lord, notice what Paul said. We sorrow not even as the rest who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. In fact, such occasions spur us on, or should, to a greater zeal so that what will be a black day for most people becomes a golden day for us because we can then be with all of those who serve God and long to be with Him in that great supernatural realm. An old gospel song rings out, Ever thankful am I that my Savior and friend promised unto the weary sweet rest Nothing more could I ask than a mansion above, there to be with the saved and the blessed. So we exclaim with the great apostle John as he wrote to Christians to comfort them, what love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, 1 John 3, 1. And conversely, how very sad for those who never really should have been born, if, I say if, they choose a life of shame and spiritual ruin in rebellion and disobedience to God, Mark 14, 21. To die outside of Christ is an eternal tragedy. That there are no words of any language of any time on earth that can describe it, John 8, 21. To be without hope and to live apart from God is just too horrible to contemplate. Let me read you some scriptures Paul wrote to the Ephesians, the church there, that would bring back to their minds how they were when they were ignorant of the gospel and living like most Gentiles lived at that time. Beginning in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read. Paul penned, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, look at the transition, the transformation. But now in Christ, ye who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace 
who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that means hate, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of two one new man, so making peace. The last verse I'll read now. And that he might reconcile both unto God, that's Jew and Gentile, in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. To have nothing precious to remember as you come to the end of your days, or you're like the rich man in the account Jesus gave, of the rich man Lazarus. He had memories. Those memories haunted him. And they're still haunting him. But he doesn't even have now what he had at the time that the Lord pictured him. Because he had five brethren back on earth who still could do something about their situation. But they're all gone now. And if they died in the shape the rich man knew they were in, they're right there with him being tormented the Lord pleads and begs and faithful brethren work and strive to get people to realize what lies ahead of those who die disobedient to the Lord I can't think of any more horrible thing than for parents who love their children or thought they loved them to die and then see their children come to be with them in torment forevermore To die without regret is a marvelous thing. And those covered by the blood of Christ can do that. And they're the only ones that can do it. But to die with great regret because you spent your time here doing as you pleased and you didn't care about God. What a thought that is. You know, that should spur the people to whom I said I wanted to address this uh, sermon to cause us to want to work harder to reach people with the gospel. Those who need it the most are aware they don't, aren't aware they need it. They don't know. I think the older I get, in fact, I know it to be the case, the more I observe people and, and realize everyone I see is going to stand before Jesus Christ and the judgment to give an account of the deeds done, or, done whether in their body, whether good or bad. Every one of them. And th think about that. What can you do to get them to realize their responsibility to God? But what's even worse are the members of the church who just kind of glide along. You know, there's a little animal, sort of like a flying squirrel. They call a sugar glider. Well, when I think of these brethren who are Christian in name only, I just call them sugar gliders. They just glide. Where's their effort to make the church a better place? Where's their effort to preach the gospel? Well, to those of us who strive, who work hard to be faithful, to study our Bibles, always trying to be better than we were before, to be more like Christ, to be willing and ready to repent of our sins and confess them, pray God for forgiveness, to encourage the brethren to do what we can do. Then we wonder at the souls lost in sin and what can we do to open their eyes to their lost condition. And those then too who are members of the church they're in a worse shape, according to Peter, than those who never know the Lord. They're like the dog that's returned to his vomit and this owl that was washed or wallowing in the mire. Now, that's tough language. But it was the Holy Spirit that said it. That's God's view of a member of the church who backslides. They don't have the hope of heaven. Since the Lord Jesus Christ has the words of eternal life, John chapter 6 and verse 68. The same words that will judge every one of us on the last day, John 12, 48. Then to say the least, it's very unwise to march toward that final moment, unprepared and void of legitimate Bible hope. The hope we possess as Christians, and I don't use this word very much, but it's truly dynamic. When I grew up, I think they overworked that word, but... Uh, do you remember some of you roughly my age how they use the word copacetic I got so tired of hearing everything it was alright and fine copacetic now you know what you hear cool 
I've heard cool longer than I heard copacetic. We have very limited vocabulary. That's what it amounts to. The hope we possess as Christians then is truly dynamic because it overwhelms the past wherein we were sinful and whereof we are not ashamed. Romans 6, 21. All of us have sinned. All of us by that sin come short of the glory of God. We know the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But we have learned the gospel. We have believed it and from the heart obeyed it and strive to live by the authority of Christ as we live the Christian life. Our Redeemer made it possible for Christianity to be the land of beginning again, where sins are blotted out, Acts 3.19, and transgressions are abundantly pardoned, as uh, Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. Paul said it this way to the Corinthians in the second letter, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Those people who take Christ at his word, those people in doing so who are willing to believe him solely on the basis of the rightly divided New Testament and are willing to obey that Savior in repenting of their sins and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins are blending their obedience into life of hope that only the gospel can convey. Just read the beginning of the church in Acts 2, 36 through 41, thinking about the hope of heaven. Presently, that is, while we're still in the flesh on this earth, then as I said in the beginning, this hope, this expectation of heaven, which we have a right to expect, and we earnestly desire to receive it. We want to go to heaven. Then this hope gives substance. And it gives depth. And it gives meaning to daily activity. Our life has boundaries based on what is said in James 4 and verse 15. If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. We are sustained in the vibrant power of a closer walk with God as he guides us continually. As the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 58 verse 11. And he guides us by his gracious benevolent hand as it were. Psalm 84 11. He is our everlasting portion. The friend that sticks closer than a brother. And the one who guides our feet in the way of peace. Luke 179. I really don't care how much you have friends or loved ones in your family who love you. They can't be as close to you as Jesus Christ can. They may sit by your bed, your deathbed, and they may hold your hand and they may bathe the fevered brow. They may offer words of comfort. But when you leave this body, you leave them behind. And then where do you go and who goes with you? Well, I don't believe it's by accident that Jesus said in Luke 16, speaking of the death of Lazarus, the poor beggar, that it says that he died and the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. I think Jesus spoke the truth. The old Negro spiritual of many, many years ago, I don't know how long, but a long time ago, talked about a band of angels coming after me. I think I know where they got that. So I firmly believe the moment that our spirit leaves this body, this is a child of God dying, a faithful child of God, and there are angels to escort him into glory. Don't know what all that involves, but it calls a thrill to my heart to think about it. Our future is also bright because we know the sovereign God is in control. When you see all that's gone on in recent days in this country and in the world, and then you read history, or if you lived as long as I have, you can remember a lot of what some of you young people have to read about to, to find out about. Let's get on YouTube and see some news uh, video of it. What sustains us? What keeps us going? Well, that's the way the world is. The world always was like that. It never has changed. One thing that we have since we can go all the way back to even before World War I for movies, that's over 100 years, 
And if you go back and read what's going on from day to day or you see what's happening, we were in the midst of a great world war 100 years ago. What is new? And go back a few years before that, Spanish-American War. Of course, then you had all the uproar with the Indians. And who's right and wrong in that? And everybody had a big mess up over that. Still are. Is there ever going to be an end to it? Yeah, there's going to be an end to it when everything ends. But as long as this world works, as this world works, it shall be as it is this very day. And can be a whole lot worse. So our future is bright because the sovereign God's in control. We may not be able to see it, but He is. As He promised, He will guide me with His counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Psalm 73, verse 24. I like those words. Now, what does he do? He guides me with his counsel. When this life is done, he'll receive me to glory. The last two verses of Jude inform us that God is able to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. Christians, therefore, as we've sung many times, have a foretaste of glory divine, and we can add to it joy unspeakable, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 7 and 8. And in that, we have our hope made richer and that it attends all who are faithful to give them strength, to persevere, to be steadfast. Because even this, all of this, shall pass away. We have comrades of like precious faith. And remember, when you think you're all alone, God will remind you why there are 6,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You may not be aware of them, but you're not all alone. And besides that, if you were the only human on earth faithfully serving God, you're not alone because God didn't want to make a majority. So what a marvelous life of depth and loyalty to our God by keeping His commandments. In this temporary and pilgrim journey of the devoted child of the living God, what we need to do is we contemplate heaven so it can help us be faithful now that we can overcome what we have to overcome, what's our lot to overcome. We need to remember the Lord saying, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So thus my faith in his gospel and my submission to the same will carry me right down the same path he went. He's overcome the world. And we need to let our frailties and our mundane existence uh, in this world become a bright and exuberant thing through our faith in God and knowing this is just a place we pass through. It's not permanent. In that final day of reunion, reward, and rejoicing, there will be no regret for those who live their life faithful here. And like all mothers who have born children, while there's great pain and sorrow, when the baby gets there, and when they're holding the little thing in their arms, that pain and sorrow goes away. Well, I'm not at all going to say in this life Christians don't have pains and sorrows, and many of them are because they're Christians, not just because they're humans and the frailties of the flesh. But I'm quite content to know that when you step out of this veil of tears and fleshly material world, those things are gone forevermore. So the one thing we all should strive for with all of our power and might is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23, 6. I close a lesson said, as I said in the beginning, to those who love the Lord and keep His commandments, to those who are faithful members of the church of Christ, those who seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto them. Matthew 6, 33. Cheer up. Rise up. Be lively in the work of the kingdom. This is not the end. It's only a transition place to prove our love of God and faith in Him and His system. And let us persevere. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you're subject then to the great invitation to become a Christian, now is the time to obey it. 
That's all the time you have is now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. If as a Christian you sort of bent a little, become weak, or maybe you've outright sinned and you just haven't wanted to deal with it, well, remember when you obeyed the gospel, you repented then, having believed in Christ, confessed your faith in Him, and you didn't mind being baptized for the remission of sin because that was the Lord's way, the only way to become a Christian. Well, now as a child of God, if you sin, humble yourself again. Repent of those sins. Rise up. Return to your first love. Pray God for forgiveness, having confessed those sins. Heaven is but a heartbeat away in one sense. And even however much time goes on in this world, knowing it's going to be the same to one extent or the other as we see in the newspaper or hear on the news or watch it on television or however you get the news. One thing for sure, this doesn't change. And it tells me how to become a Christian and it tells me that there is a heaven. Recently, I spent quite a bit of time visiting with the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos and reading the marvelous book of Revelation. And toward the end of it is where he talks about the glory of heaven. And you know, he can't even speak of it in plain words because there's no words, just plain words, that can describe its glory, its majesty, its peace, and the contentment of all people that are there. So he has to use symbolic terms. And even then, as he paints those word pictures, it's just so hard to realize what a place heaven must be. So if you're subject to the great invitation of Christ, realize this is just a little while here, no matter how long you might live on earth. But eternity is unending. So respond to the gospel, live faithful to him, and come to Jesus while we stand and sing.